so maybe start with this. What you J.K. Rowling is the get of all gets for people doing a podcast, doing a radio program. Everyone wants J.K. Rowling, and you got her. Why do you think she wanted to talk to you? Um, I think you definitely have to ask her about that. Um, I, I really can't account for it. Um, I can tell you what I said to her um, and what I what I wrote in the letter, um, which was essentially that I was very, I told her I was very concerned about what social media was doing to public discourse, you know, how it is incentivizing extremes and amplifying our worst impulses and how I recognize some of those impulses from my former church. So I was raised in the Westboro Baptist Church, which a lot of people would consider a religious cult. Um, and there are several features of the way that I was raised that I have started seeing more broadly in the mainstream. And I mean, I actually give a TED talk about this um, more than five years ago now. And and essentially, I mean, two of the big ones are, you know, black and white thinking. And also just the fact that we were willing to go after people verbally um, whenever they disagreed with us. And I, I think it's, I'm of the opinion that part of the reason that we don't hear as much about Westboro anymore, my former church anymore, is because so many of the tactics and tones that we used are now so common. Like they're, they're, they're the things that made us infamous are, are now very common. We've all um, become Westboro in a sort of horrible way. Yeah. I mean, and I, I don't want to like overstate that parallel, but I absolutely have been seeing them for a while now. Um, and I, I find it very alarming and also just, just very sad. Um, I think I also in that letter quoted the writer, Marilyn Robinson, who I love. Um, she, she, I think put it mildly when she said that, the language of public life has lost the character of generosity. And, you know, I benefited profoundly from that generosity, both while I was at the church, when people took the time to kind of listen to where I was coming from and to argue me out of, to, to build a bridge really from where I was to where they were to, to help me see outside of that paradigm. Um, and then I also benefited profoundly once I left the church, um, you know, people who were willing to let me move on from from that life and to sort of not hold my sins against me, if you will, um, for the rest so of the So that was life. social media. Well, I'm really struck by that, that because it's easy to blame social media as a, as a curse, which I do all the time. And yet for you at the beginning, social media was a good thing because um, your church effectively encouraged narrowness of thinking. This is the world. This is the orthodoxy. Everything else is wrong. And social media was a world outside of that that was broad and diverse and interesting. So how did it get from that to a place where the church is at, the, the, the methods of your church become dominant? It's, it's kind of a, so the shift has happened in, in recent times, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I actually believe that if I had left even maybe a year and a half or two after I left, um, I, I, I think things had started to shift profoundly by that point. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that I, I left when I did. Um, but to answer your question, I think part of it is that when, you know, I grew up on the picket line. So I was five years old when the church started protesting. So from the age of five, I was put in a position to articulate and defend these doctrines that that most people found so, so hateful. And I was constantly met with, um, you know, the shaming and the anger and the rage um, that sort of was reflected back at, at me and my family. And so I was used to that. So when I got on social media and all of that was there, it was just, you know, like it was, it, was a, it was a normal day for me. What was different, though, was that I was able, you know, I was able to have these conversations over time. So, you know, obviously standing on the picket line, I'm only there for, you know, half an hour, up to a few hours at most. Um, and here I was talking to the same people, some of the same people over time and developing rapport and relationships with these people, um, even in the limited way that social media allows for. Um, and that was huge. So there was this emotional component, but then there was also the the logical component, you know, people who took the time to listen to where I was coming from and to find internal inconsistencies in Westboro's doctrines. And the combination of those two things was extremely powerful. Um, and, and I think eventually th that became the thread. Th those were the threads that eventually unraveled the entire doctrine that I was such a staunch believer in for, for so long, for my whole life. So you, it benefited you, but as you say, things have changed. What was one of your first questions to J.K. Rowling, to Joe, why the hell are you doing this? The thing I've always wondered about this is that 
you know, she will be remembered. J.K. Rowling will be remembered for as long as people read books, for as long as people have children who read books. She mm -hmm. has done this great thing. She's a wonderful influence on the culture of the world because of these books she wrote. She's a yeah. billionaire. I mean, you met her in a castle. You know, she has more money than she could ever possibly need. Did you say to her, why are you doing this? Why are you on social media? Why, why have you allowed this into your life? Because you can't need this. You needed it because it got you to where you needed to go. She was already there. She'd, she'd won. Yeah. Did you, did you say that to her? Absolutely. I mean, I really tried hard, and you will hear this in the later episodes of the series, um, to give voice to the concerns of her critics. Um, and as open as you heard her in the first couple of episodes where she is going back to these like very dark moments in her own life, she was very open to that criticism and to responding in a way that I think will surprise people. Um, and, and so I, I really encourage people to, to keep listening. Can you give us a hint? So people, people will go listen to it, but what, what sort of thing are you talking about? You mean in the later episodes? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just mean social media. Again, I, I say that it amplifies our, our worst impulses. Um, and it, I think it's very distorting in a lot of ways. So, I mean, for instance, if you go and just you know, go, go search on Twitter for, uh, for her name and you see the kind of um, the, the venom really that, that is aimed in her direction. And even if you think that it's justifiable, I think that if you go and read that for any length of time, yeah. you can see how it would be extremely distorting. Um, and I, one of the reasons that I wanted to go, you know, I'm not a trained journalist at all. Again, I, I, I said this, she was the first person I'd ever interviewed and, and it really wasn't an interview. It was a conversation um, because I very strongly believe in the power of conversation. Um, and I, I think that the, the version of JK Rowling's positions um, as she articulated them to me are in much greater depth than you will find on Twitter. Um, yeah. and, and I think, again, even if you disagree with her, like much more comprehensible. Um, and, and is that her, is that her fault or our fault or the medium's fault? Because you've got 240 characters. You can't be nuanced in 240 characters. And as you say that the, the um, there is this sort of strange dopamine hit for people to, to dunk on, on others. And, and there's a sort of antagonistic approach. So does she have to, did you say this to her? Does she own this a, a bit herself to say, you know what, maybe Twitter isn't the right forum for this type of debate? Um, I, I, she, we didn't actually talk about, um, I don't think that last part specifically, but, uh, but she absolutely does, I think, um, uh, talk about the role that she plays in this. Um, and, and, you know, it's very hard. For, I, I understand. Like, I think people, um, I don't think that the people who engage me had a had a duty or an obligation to do what they did um, in in trying to persuade me away from my beliefs. Um, but I do believe very strongly that the more of us who are willing and able to have those conversations with nuance, um, the better off all of us will be. And that's that's been my message for the last ten years since I since I left Westboro. You talked about if you put her name into the search engine, you can see some horrendous stuff. That's undoubtedly true. Does she do that? Is that the, that I, I'm I'm interested with someone like that. Do you have to? I mean, you're going to have this as well now because you're going to be very notable in this culture war. You're you're putting your your name into this culture war yourself. Does she have to not read that stuff? Do you have to not read stuff? Is that a thing we can do? Actually, not to go looking for some of these people who are saying horrible things. I mean, I've not put my name into a, a search engine for years, uh, and I'm nobody, but I'm still not worth the the risk because why would you bother see what horrible people might be saying about you? Right. So I, I don't think that she goes and searches for her name. I do think, you know, on Twitter, obviously, there's a there's a tab, you just have to click mentions. Um, and if you have any interest in engaging in this public conversation, which she clearly does, um, like that is the place that you go to and, and what you have to sift through. Um, I think there's also another, um, another thing that people point to, which is, especially, I mean, you know, she's been very open about the fact that she has been the subject of, uh, you know, many, many kinds of threats. Um, and not all of them are, are like people who will probably take, actually take action, but some definitely will. And, you know, of course she has the police contacting her about, you know, about threats and things that are, that they consider legitimate. And, and that you can see like, that's how the episode that just came out today opens is with some of those threats that, that she receives. Um, and yeah, so I think you can't be blind to it, I think. And if, again, if you have any interest in engaging and she does, um, it's inevitable that you will see that. And it takes very little time, you know, there, yeah, it takes very little time to 
to be really overwhelmed by the content of some of those things. Like I am somebody who, you know, coming from Westboro, of course we were the subject of many different kinds of threats as well and all kinds of hate, which I, I completely understand, you know, in, in hindsight. Um, but it, it is very distorting and it is uh, like, yeah, it, it, it's hard to articulate that the, the content of some of the things, many of the things that JK Rowling receives, it, I found it shocking even coming from the background that I come from. So do you think she is more abused than, than you previously imagined, actually? It's, it's, I mean, I mean... It, again, it's, it's very hard to articulate. It, I have spent, so it's actually been almost two years since I uh, first you know, talked to my, my colleagues, Andy Mills and, and Matt Bull, uh, about making this series. Um, and so in that time, I, I have obviously spent a lot of time seeing what has come at her, um, you know, in response to the the things that she's posted, the comments that she's made, um, and I'm still constantly seeing new things. But in, for uh, for an episode that's that's coming up, um, I recently went and I was you know sort of going through just what came in the few days just after she posted in June of 2020, um, and as much as I had seen before, just scrolling through those responses. Uh, uh, it, like I said, it was shocking. Um, and I think, I think anybody would see that and be alarmed, um, to say the least. Do you think there's a curse that people who, I always think that this is true of Westboro, actually, I can't trust people who believe they're a hundred percent right about anything. Nobody is a hundred percent right. There is no belief that is a hundred percent accurate. And therefore, if you start from the premise that you're completely right, then you're probably going to be intolerant of people who you think are wrong. Mm -hmm. Is there a kind of curse of awful piety of people who think that she's on the wrong side of an argument, they're so right, therefore sort of moral standards just disappear and, and therefore it's okay? Because I can't believe, maybe some of them are psychopaths. Maybe some people, some of them would come up to a, to a, to a woman in the street and say these horrendous, hateful things. But I suspect most of them wouldn't. So at some point there's a moral bypass going on. And I wonder if that's partly because it's social media, not there. But also partly if you're so high on your own righteousness, then, then maybe you, you just all your standards just fall away. Yeah, I mean, there is this it's really you, you just articulated, I think, a major part of my worldview, which is, you know, coming from the, the idea that we were 100 percent right. Um, it, you get to this um, this sense of like the end justifies the means, right? Because if you are so certain that the other other side is wrong, um, one, they're not worth listening to. Um, in fact, it might even be dangerous to listen to them. Um, you know, so, so there's all kinds of reasons that sort of shut you off from hearing what they're actually saying. Um, but also, again, it, it it does make you willing to do things that you never otherwise would. Certainty, I, I think that is the the fundamental difference in how I see the world now versus how I did at Westboro. Um, and is she, and, and is, I mean, it's interesting though, because is she as, I mean, she doesn't do anything hateful. I don't think JK Rowling, but she brings certainty to this debate as well, doesn't she? So, so it's two sides, both preaching certainty. I think if you listen, for instance, to the end of episode two, um, you know, she, she does address, address this idea um, uh, of certainty. And if you listen to later episodes, I think again, you will be surprised by what she says about that, both in respect to certain, with respect to certainty in general, but also um, in her own position. I think it will surprise you. Do you admire her more having spoken to her? I I found her incredibly warm and generous. I'm very grateful she took the time to sit down with me. I would say, you know, from the opening question, um, I was. I mean, it's, it's hard to, it's, again, this is my first interview, right? So I asked the first question. You hear that first question in the first episode. It was a throwaway question. It was a warm-up question that we were just going to like, okay, we'll get to the real real thing right after that. Her response was so thoughtful. Uh, you know, we decided to include it in the series, but listening to her answer that question, I was like, oh God, you know, maybe I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not, uh, maybe I'm not smart enough or thoughtful enough to, uh, um, and, you know, that was also probably just nerves. But I think, again, if you listen to to the sh to the series and listen to how she responds to critics, to how she like very we, we, we spent a lot of time um, at the end of the series, uh, at the end of our conversations, rather um, talking about discernment. You know, it was one of the questions, the biggest questions I had after I left Westboro was 
how can I ever trust my mind again? How can I know? I was so certain that I was right. And now I'm, I'm convinced that I was wrong. How can I ever trust myself again? And I spent a long time discussing that idea with JK Rowling. How do you know in the face of this massive backlash um, to your statements from people who you saw as allies and, 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 and friends, um, what, what, what makes you think this is the right path? Um, and, and again, we, we, we went into great depth on that. Um, and I, I think people will, will hear, hear things that, that surprise them and, and, um, and that, that, that are important to think about no matter where you're coming from in this debate. And so do you admire her more, I suppose? Oh, I mean, I, I, I would say, I think it's hard. I, I'm generally not a, um, you know, person who puts a lot of stock in celebrity in general. Um, I had read her books and really loved them as a kid. Like, I mean, you know, growing up, I think I was um, around Harry's age when when the books began and I was, I was a massive fan. Um, but I hadn't paid attention so much in the years since. So I, I didn't know what to expect. I would say, though, that I, I, I admire the fact that she was willing to have the conversation and that, yeah, yeah, that even in spite of you know, all, all of, you know, all the reasons she would have not to, and that she obviously didn't have this, this conversation with, with so many other people who had asked. And just finally, Megan, is there any hope? Because having this conversation with you, I kind of worry that, you know, we've, we've both got kids. This is the world they grew up in. You didn't grow up with this world because you were, you were part of, uh, of the cult, but I didn't grow up in this world because I'm just the right age to have grown up pre-technology really. I'm 42. And so I'm at that tipping point that, there was no phones, no email until I was in my late teens. But my kids aren't like that. Your kids won't be like that. You're not bringing up your kids in, a, in an orthodox cult. You're bringing them up in the world. And the, the world is a world of, of social media and meanness. You, do you come out of this feeling optimistic or actually the opposite of that? Absolutely optimistic. I mean, and part of this is just a result of the fact that I, I, I cannot... If you could be inside my brain and the kind of person and thinker I was when I was at Westboro, I was very well intentioned, um, but that certainty can be so blinding. And yet through these conversations on Twitter, on Twitter of all places, um, my life is completely transformed. The life that I live right now, um, my wonderful husband I, I met on, on Twitter, the, fa the father of my two children. Um, it's, it's very hard for me to think anything other than there are people on all sides of this. And all, if we can recognize that, if we can, you know, again, be willing to engage, even when we passionately disagree, the, the power of conversation is such that it, I believe it can bridge any divide, which is why I reached out to, to JK Rowling in the first place. So the lesson for everyone is, is maybe if you believe something 100%, you should pause and allow the prospect of doubt into your mind. And that might make you a little bit more courteous of other people. And, and even if you remain certain that you are 100% right, the way that you choose to engage can have a massive effect on the thinking of the person that you're, that you're speaking with. Far more than shame or blame, as understandable as those, the instinct, the impulse to, to wield those against um, people who believe differently than you do. It's a very strong impulse to do that, but, but conversation, questions, um, you know, that kind of kind consideration. Um, those were the things that, that, that really changed hearts and minds. Well, listen, Meg, it's a fascinating, it's a great podcast. It's the greatest get in the history of podcasts, JK Rowling. It's also, I think, one of the most important issues of the age and how we've gone from, I saw this, this ridiculous piece in, the, in an online magazine where it talks about JK Rowling and said effectively that history would only remember her for her views on trans people which is ludicrous. The history will remember her for being an author that, that sold a billion books and, and gave the gift of reading to a, a billion children. But this is a big issue, but isn't I it? How we conduct that, ourselves. I, I spend a lot of time talking to, to trans people as well. And um, their stories will come up uh, in these later episodes as well. And for people who think that their positions are completely you know, unintelligible, I think too, or, or maybe overstated or extreme, um, we do the same thing for, for, for trans people, um, who disagree with rolling for rolling and also for the, the same, the same way we did for the Christians in episode two, it's not about shame or blame or dismissing concern. It's about trying to illuminate where people are coming from, because I think that that lack of understanding 
it comes from all sides. And, and yeah. so it's a huge part of, of our goal with this podcast to, to kind of illuminate that for, for, for people, because it's, it's much more understandable, I think, than many people realize. Yeah. 